To start things off in today's program, Brian Dumain talks with the head of OPIC, that's the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Uh, they mobilize private capital, something we were talking about also yesterday a little bit. They mobilize private capital to help solve critical development challenges uh, all around the world. Now, it sounds like a wonderful thing to do. It is a wonderful thing to do, but it's complicated, okay? They stopped financing coal plants in response to criticism, and then they got more criticism because they weren't financing affordable electricity, okay? Kind of a deep thing. What are they going to do? Well, please welcome Fortune's Brian Dumain and the president and CEO of OPIC, Elizabeth Littlefield. Good morning, everyone. So, Elizabeth. Yes, sir. OPIC. What exactly is it that you do? Jeff gave us a nice introduction, but what you do is a little complicated, but I think once we understand it, it could be really um, uh, some v of value to the people in this room. Uh, so what, what does OPIC do? Uh, yes, thank you very much, and thanks for being here. I've learned a lot already, and I'm looking forward to the rest of today. Um, <clears throat> our mandate is to support private capital flowing into emerging markets into things that are good for the world sustainable economic development. So, and we do that by providing financing, like long-term, even 20-year financing, and risk mitigants, like political risk insurance, to investors that are investing uh, in emerging markets. Um, we run about a $16 billion portfolio right now uh, in 105 countries. Mm -hmm. um, we will only do things that the private markets and private bankers won't finance. Mm -hmm. We'll only do things that are highly developmental, and we really do try to focus on the poor countries of the world. Okay. Give us a couple of examples of the, some projects that you're doing, and with who's the business partner? How's it structured? What's the um, uh, the technology or the uh, project that's been developed in these countries? So, as as was mentioned, we we have had a real focus on on renewable resources, broadly speaking. And maybe I'll just tell you what we've done in that space, sure. and then give you a couple of examples. Um, so, when I arrived at OPIC about th a little less than three years ago, we decided to focus have a singular focus on renewable resources. You know, we could have done the typical like three priorities. We just, mm -hmm. we just chose just one, and it's, I think, an indication of just how important we feel that is. So we decided to focus on renewable resources, meaning energy, but also meaning water, forestry, agriculture, mm -hmm. all that nature produces. And prior to that, you've been investing in you know, coal plants and other types of Well, not cars. just coal plants. Well, but <laughs> right, okay. So but. prior to that, actually, traditionally, we had been a power banker, and so we had a lot of very large, uh, large greenhouse gas intensive mm -hmm. uh, uh, projects on our books, and I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Mm -hmm. So we decided to focus on renewable resources, and I'm incredibly proud to say that we, at that time, we had $10 million uh, in portfolio, in an annual portfolio in renewables. That went from 10 million to 100 million to 300 million to a billion and a billion six over three and a half years, mm -hmm. which is just incredible uh, mm -hmm. to see how quickly that grows. And of course, I like to think it's testament not only to the, the nimbleness and the agility of this little government agency, we call it government at the speed of business, right? Um, but it's also a testament to the incredible demand that we're seeing amongst investors to invest in these kind of projects in emerging mm -hmm. markets. So, you asked for a couple of examples. Yeah, well, wind project in Chile, for example. We've done a couple of wind projects in Chile and, and Peru, but the range is really, I think, what's interesting. So, for example, uh, there's an engineer that went to school out here in California, the Indian-American man named Indrapreet, who wanted to go back and invest in solar power in India. Mm -hmm. And we helped him set up and finance the first ever solar energy being sold into the Indian grid. Mm -hmm. Similarly, working with another California-based entrepreneur who um, has gone back to Pakistan and is investing in a biomass project, 12 megawatts, uh, using agricultural waste, cane, uh, rice husk, whatnot. Right. To and you guaranteed his, his financing? No, we, we, we made a loan. We made, you made an actual loan. Made, made so you, you can make a loan, you can guarantee financing? We can do loans, we can do guarantees, and we can do uh, political risk insurance. And but that was just the small end. So those mm -hmm. are sort of five, ten, fifteen million dollar financings, all the way out to last year we financed the expansion of Kenya's, one of Kenya's geothermal facilities, uh, 310 million dollars for one transaction. So mm -hmm. The range is really quite, uh, quite and, and, fast. And Elizabeth is probably too modest to tell you this, but it's a quasi-governmental institution, and 
you return money to the taxpayer. Is that correct every year? I do. Uh, it is very, you know, I, when I'm in Washington, I, in these, this day and age, I say it almost every 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> but no, we actually do, you know, we do development, we help businesses, we advance foreign policy, and we do all that and return between 250 and 350 million dollars every year to the taxpayer because we do charge you know, commercial And despite rates. that, you have some frustrations that you can't grow bigger. I mean, we're in a tight fiscal pinch in Washington. You feel there's a huge market opportunity for a lot of companies to expand in Africa and South America, and you're willing to help them do it. But what, your hands are tied a bit? So it's, you know, it's an odd situation. We have um, $29 billion in capital allocated to us, but we've only got 220 people. So actually, we can really only do about 100 deals a year. Mm -hmm. And it's frustrating because we'd like to be able to serve more businesses, do more development, advance renewable right. energy in emerging markets, and help and, and make more money. But right, right now, we're, we're really in a bind in that regard. So actually, we talked about the greenhouse gas emissions. And we have committed to a, a, a cut of the greenhouse gas emissions off of the corpus of our portfolio, 50% cut by 2023. Since we've shifted to renewable energy so dramatically, mm -hmm. We're having no problem meeting those targets, um, but it, actually the greenhouse gases are not really a, our constraint. The constraint is really human right. resources. Um, and on the greenhouse gas thing, and yeah. then I'm going to open it up to questions uh, here. Uh, well, two, two quick questions before I open up. One, um, some people have pointed out, well, if you're, you're bringing renewable energy to the developing world, it doesn't have to be more expensive than coal, and how can people afford that energy? And when you answer that one, uh, just answer that and then I'll follow you up, follow so, up to the next one. You know, people talk about renewables as being more expensive. You don't really hear that debate so much in Africa. And it's not just because, of course, the prices of technologies have come down so dramatically, mm -hmm. so much so that in many parts of the world, we're expecting, you know, leapfrogging of entire systems. Mm -hmm. um, but also remember that Africa, only 25% of that continent has access to reliable energy at all. Mm -hmm. So in many cases, you're not comparing you know, wind to, to grid-connected coal, you're comparing, comparing wind or rooftop solar to diesel flown in on prop planes into the middle of the you know, Democratic mm -hmm. Republic of Congo. So it's not hard to beat that from, uh, from a cost perspective. Yeah. So we're seeing more and more opportunities, not just for grid-connected um, renewable energy, but for, very importantly, for off-grid renewables, mm -hmm. which is really the only way much of that continent is going to yeah. get its energy in the next And the, year. the other question is, before we open it up, is, um, if someone in this audience wanted to get some help to bring their, their product, their technology, whatever, into uh, some risky part of the world, do they just call you up? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> She's open for sure. business. Okay. You little, right. <laughs> you little field at opic.gov. There we go. So, uh, we, and I would, can I just say on that? Sure. I mean, I do think it is, it is having worked in emerging markets much, much of my career, first in, uh, in investment banking and then at the World Bank, it is amazing to me how isolated American companies are. We see, we see the Europeans, the Asians, of course the Chinese, Middle Eastern mm -hmm. companies investing aggressively in Africa because of the incredible opportunities there. Mm -hmm. And yet Americans are very, are very underrepresented there. And it's frustrating for me because I see Africa as being one of the most exciting continents to invest in. It's got incredible GDP growth. The countries are putting in place business reforms to make a more welcoming investment climate Mm -hmm. uh, aggressively, they're some of the, the most improved on the World Bank's doing business report are African countries. Right, and you can we're help seeing, mitigate the risk of going into countries it, like exactly. that. Exactly. Right. Good. We're also seeing a, a reversal of the brain drain. Mm -hmm. So we have a question. We here. got a question. Identify, Amy. Uh, can you stand up and identify yourself, Amy? Amy Christensen, Christensen Global Strategies. Um, Elizabeth, you talked about the fact that you only. Uh, bring your money where the private sector won't go. Yes. Do you, how do you then partner with the private sector? Do they just naturally follow you after you've shown the reduced risk, you've shown the returns? Do you actively partner with the financial sector on the private side? How do you work with them? Uh, thanks for that, that question, Amy. Um, in a number of ways. Sometimes a, a company w wants to make an investment in a country, but the financing is not available, and they don't have the cash flow to finance it, so we'll pro provide anywhere from 10 to 20 or even financing for that. In other cases, you know, a private investor wants to go, but they're concerned about the risk. So for example, investing in Egypt right now, not an obvious thing to do, we'll say to the investors, you focus on the, just the strictly the commercial risk, the business risk, and we'll take care of all of the political risk that is associated. So if there's a loss of your investment because of political violence, expropriation, and convertibility of the currency, we'll cover that loss. 
And some of these partnerships you know, range from, you know, we have a, a, a framework agreement with Citigroup, for example, where a city will originate loans throughout its network, and then we guarantee 75% of those loans. We have another one with Marriott, for example, where we've put together, I think it's a $100 million facility for Marriott to borrow, Marriott's actually, Marriott's investors to borrow from us to build green hotels in low-income countries. Um, so those are, so the, I mean, the examples, I can keep going on, but those are just a couple of I, I wish we could, but unbelievably our time's over already. So let's hear for Elizabeth Littlefield of OPEC. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thank Brian. You, Thanks, Brian.